things that we should definitely touch on is what you've written about that is uh, women in education in academia Absolutely. and it translating to the workforce um, could you just shed some light on that so something very interesting is happening and uh, you know there's a reason why we're so excited about this the status of women in india is dramatically increasing uh, and there is a uh, you know there is a reason why this is so important back in uh, you know in 1947 during the time of independence policy makers did not focus on educating the girl child in fact they actively defocused educating the girl child and if you compare this with china you know chairman mao of the people's republic of china famously said women hold up half the sky he focused on educating the uh, china's girl children and today you can see that the effect of that in high literacy rates in high workforce participation and of course china has that's been one of the drivers for china to grow as an economy to, to a top two economy today india after say the economic liberalization in 1991 when the markets opened up you can see the the women's literacy is starting to sh shoot up. So in 1991, it was 43%. In 2015, it was something like 67%. Today, it must be above 70%. So that's going up. Uh, in the meanwhile, our fertility has dramatically dropped at the same time. So it was something observed like 3.4 uh, in 1991. By 2015, it had come down to 2. Right. And the trend lines show that it might have even decreased below 2 today. So our population is stabilizing and women's literacy is going up. And that is translating into higher education as well. Right. So if you look at data from 2011 to 2019, as we have from the MHRD ISHA data, uh, women's enrollment has go is going up by 4.9% year on year. So that's the CAGR. Whereas male enrollment, unfortunately, is dropping to, it's about 2.5%. And in between 2017 and 2018, just in one the interval of one year, women's enrollment increased by 7.5 lakhs, whereas wow. male enrollment only increased by 5,000. 5,000 right. people all over India. Wow. So women are clearly joining higher education with very clear aspirations and uh, the next thing we need to do is provide them employment opportunities. Right. See, this is not just a South, South India phenomenon that is happening across India, even in places like Bihar with very low gross enrollment ratios, women's enrollment uh, uh, CAGRs are higher than ma male enrollment growth rates. Right. Even within the Muslim community, which has one of the lowest GERs, gross enrollment ratios today in India, women's enrollment uh, uh, rate is higher at 8.7 percent compared to male enrollment at 6.5 percent. So this is a pan-India phenomena where women are increasingly going towards higher education to, uh, you know, improve their livelihood, to contribute to the economy. So the next thing we need to do is um, uh, provide ample opportunities for employment where they can utilize their degree, uh, hopefully very close to home because women cannot migrate as easily right. as men. So that's another reason why women's unemployment is higher. So but but it's very clear women are going towards higher education and India needs to utilize this potential for economic growth. But yeah. what's providing the impetus for this actually? Well, what are the contributing factors? Uh, in say higher enrollment, for instance, so is I it societal attitudes, uh, the change in them, or is it the government infrastructure? What's what's uh, so societal uh, attitudes are changing, no doubt. I also think the literacy rates have been going up since 1991, right. and so women are recognizing that higher education is the next uh, thing for them to take on after literacy. So if you see primary school enrollment is nearly at 100% now, secondary education is going up. So women are naturally moving towards higher education as the next thing. And you know, some northern states are doing very well with improving with infrastructure. For example, if you see Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan, they're building very good infrastructure. And places like Uttar Pradesh, uh, you know, it's the statistics are startling. Uh, last year, 91 lakh graduates all over India, out of which 16 lakh from Uttar Pradesh alone, uh, more than half of them are women. So it's it's very clear that they're seeing higher education as a way to aspire. Right. And so we need to see what the next step is. Yeah. The Indian mother has to be great. Yeah. Absolutely. Mothers all across India will eat one meal less, but they want their child to go to go for higher education. Maybe 30 years back, because of poverty, the priority was the boy. Right. Now the priority is the girl. And Modi's policy of uh, uh, Beti Bachao, I think it's worked yeah. because psychologically we have seen the last five years a huge jump right and the attitude that the girl child is important the attitude of upa one and two which invested a lot in uh, woman empowerment in uh, starting women's colleges and all that see all governments have done good work right There's no one government which stands out eh, because they continue and i think this attitude society that the girl child is important that we need a ratio for girls we have to make sure we get a protective environment we must give them opportunity as there 
and young girls today uh, don't want to get married at an early age. And one way of escaping the social pressure to marry is to do uh, your degree and okay. uh, do a master's degree. Yes. I'm sure that uh, if you look at data, maybe Nisha should pull it out, you'll find that when you do uh, your master's degree, there are more girls than boys. Right. And in PhD too, you'll find a gender balance where there'll be more women going to do PhD. And I think it's remarkable because they see clearly that their way is there. Right. Now, India is something like 518, 958 women per thousand men or something like that. Yeah. And I read a report which says out of 958, about 40 women don't marry. Okay. They remain as spinsters. Wow. So for women today, independence as a person to decide her own future is predicated on getting educated. Right. So you go to girls in schools, they want to go to college. Every girl, whether you're a Muslim, SEST, anybody, BC, anybody, they want to go to college. All right. want to go to college. And many of them want to do the master's degree. So I think that yeah. inner drive has come. Yeah. And the Indian mother, maybe many of whom suffered themselves because they were very bright, they wanted to go to college, they didn't get an opportunity, they married, they had children, they struggled. They don't want their daughter to go through the same agony. And right. since family sizes have come down, you must remember in the last 20 years, fertility has come down. Right. Family size has come down. People have only maybe two children or at best three children. And they want to make sure that every child is educated. And it's a remarkable transformation in India in the last 20 years. And that's why you're seeing this. In fact, um, Nisha and I believe that uh, 2030 will be the decade of Indian, Indian women. women. Wow. Yes. Indian women yes. will dominate India in society, in industry, in academics, in every field of activity. And the first step has been more girls in college, uh, you know, in comparison to the population than boys. Right. And that has come. Their gross enrollment rate is higher. Second will be more girls graduating. And the third will be more girls and women in higher education. More women coming in politics because of the 50% reservation. Right. It's not 30 years something. And I think it's working very well because women have become independent. Yeah. And I think today with media, with so many uh, women portals, so much happening here, Yes. I think it's a decade of Indian women and our society will be fundamentally transferred, uh, transformed in the next 10 years. And if you look at Muslim women, their fertility has come down by 30% from 2000. Uh, from 1991 to 2015. Yes. I mean, she'll talk about it. She knows the data. And I think the fertility has come down. Yeah. Uh, their enrollment has gone up. Higher, highest, 7.8%. 8.7%. 8.7%. 8.7% is, is the highest. Is enormous. I, I think it's unbelievable what has happened. The Muslims are the most behind in education, but the Muslim women are far ahead of everybody. Wow. So, um, the time that I did my schooling in college, which is 90s and 2000s, at that time, the priority seemed more like you go and do your BE or B.Tech, you get a degree and then you go get a job. Uh, and that's how things seemed to happen, at least in my experience at that time. Uh, specialization as such. Um, that is, you go on and you specialize in an area, say the master's or PhD. Uh, what's been uh, the state of that? Like, has it has it risen over the years? So, domain competence. Coming back to domain competency, right? India uh, has seen, seen some traditional fields where people have always been enrolling. In fact, uh, out 23 lakhs out of 91 lakh graduates last year were uh, uh, had bachelor of arts degrees, and that's always been a traditional pursuit. Coming to engineering and technology, there's a little bit of a worrisome trend because over the last seven years, it's actually been reducing at a growth rate of seven uh, of two percent year on year right. so the number of students enrolling in engineering degrees and technology degrees are actually reducing and that's worrisome because we need to invest more in our innovation engine uh, the other domains have some encouraging trends for example bsc bachelor of science bachelor of commerce mbbs degrees are all on right. the rise mbbs degrees has been seeing a 10 percent growth rate year on year it's still a small number but it's very encouraging right so i think uh it is, a, it is important that we invest in certain critical areas right. uh, for specialization. And the reason is very clear. The world is getting more and more knowledge intensive. And knowledge intensivity means increased specialization. Now, the need for general education is there, but we have to invest at the top. Because the top will have a disproportionate impact on the entire pyramid. 
disproportionate. Right. So unless you invest at the top, you create PhDs with deep knowledge, you create masters with deep knowledge in many areas of specialization, <laughs> India will lose out. And uh, there is another peculiar thing that is there in India, which I think Nisha probably will have to give data. Uh, we graduate about, we have about 40,000 PhDs a year, but we have 700,000 students outside India, 202,000 right. in the United States, and I'm 60% of them doing graduate studies. Maybe 20,000 PhDs or 25,000 PhDs. Yeah. We have about 40, 45,000 in Canada. We have about 20, 25,000 in uh, England because it's come down. Uh, in uh, Europe, the whole of Europe, we may be having some 60, 70,000. Right. Uh, China, we may be having 15, 20,000. Central Asia, maybe 15, 20,000. And uh, Australia, maybe 50, 60,000. And uh, maybe New Zealand is another 40, 45,000. Maybe Singapore, there could be 10, 15,000. So if you look all over, we are probably spending close to about 10 to 15 billion dollars outside. Right. And a large part of it in the United States especially is going for specialized degrees. Now, we are educating them. Maybe a large number will come back because postdoctoral uh, you know, capacity in the US is saturated as in Europe because the economies are growing slower. Right. And many of them won't get those faculties. They have to come back. So the good opportunity for India. But we have to improve the specialization here. That's why having these 100 universities which are research-based is very important for the specialization. Right. Now, as far as the poor are concerned, they don't have a choice. So we require more scholarship for bright, poor people, poor young students uh, who can possibly aim for specialization. So the quantum of uh, you know, fellowships for PhDs should increase to at least 100,000. Right. From 40,000 to 100,000. 40,000 graduate, I guess 40,000 come in. It must increase. Uh, Dr. Anil Kakurkar wrote the report for uh, IITs where he said the IIT should have a minimum PhD output of 10,000 a year. I think now they got about four to 5,000 a year. Yeah. They must get 10,000 a year. Because if we don't do that, we won't have capacity. These are 1.3 billion people. Right. right. Now, if you don't produce more PhDs than uh, the UK does, it will be a shame. UK's only population is 65 million as much as Karnataka, right? Now, each state should focus on top of the pyramid. Now, the good thing is, at the bottom, more and more people are coming into colleges, capacity is coming up, etc. Our challenge is on the top. And the top, we need that 5,000 crore research funding to be given as a grant, grant for research on a competitive basis, so that more research will come in this institution, a proper classification, and a much enhanced PhD and master's degree, not in that uh, JNU type social sciences and all that. Right. Because if you look at uh, maybe the topics where they study for the PhDs, I mean, you'll have deep questions to ask as to what are the use of those PhDs and those topics they're studying. Right. So right. I think in the sciences and in technology, we do need. And in certain areas of, uh, you know, specialization like archaeology, like anthropology, right. uh, we may need. We may need in commerce and we may, we may need in the medical life sciences, we need a lot more PhDs because uh, we need them for teaching. Right. And also in light of the fact that we are moving towards uh, the gig economy in terms of people sort of moving away from the nine to five model. And but that's a very different, different that's issue. A that's a very different issue. Right. Uh, it, right. it is more driven by individual preferences. Right. right. And less by company preferences. Right. Because <coughs> people who have got uh, degrees which are specialized in technology, for instance, uh, don't want to spend all the time in the same company if the work is not exciting. Right. And now there's scarcity of such talent. They probably will do consulting in many companies. Right. So, but going back to how the economy is changing, right? Today, we're seeing a knowledge economy-led growth. Previously, economies were either agricultural or industrial, and they needed um, what we call physical capital. So they needed machinery, farmland, land for building industry, manual labor. These were the determinants. Right. But today, human capital has become the determinant in, uh, in the knowledge economy. And for human capital development to improve, uh, say, services, for example, if you look at services-led economies, you look at financial services, you look at IT services, where the value add to the economy is so high that we need to focus on improving our work workforce in those sectors where the value add is high to the right. GDP. And that is where human capital comes in. And for human capital to come in, we need higher education, specialization, and all these other uh, factors. So this is why specialization becomes very important. And we need specialization in different fields. So if you look at our numbers in agricultural sciences and medical sciences, IT and computers, they're very low. But the new uh, frontiers are in artificial tech, uh, artificial intelligence, are in agricultural productivity. So we need to improve our specialization in these niche fields to be able to uh, use the knowledge economy properly to improve our economic output. 
Right, right. And you also spoke about how different states have to sort of up their game. Like often we talk about education in India and it becomes such a big picture view. Uh, but taking it down to states, um, like different states have uh, different states at which they are in terms of their education as well. Would you like to speak about that? So what we did in our report is we looked at four zones. We we uh, we picked state representative states from different zones. We looked at the north central zone as one, the east zone, the southern zone, and the western zone. Now, uh, what we also did was not only use higher education statistics, but we also extrapolated it to uh, economic output, to per capita GDP, to urbanization levels, to fertility rates and population growth rates. And we're real realizing that India is not one one uh, is not one country right. and so one common policy is not going to work all across India. So if you look at the southern states and uh, and Maharashtra, they are doing very well. Gross enrollment ratios are very high, per capita GDPs are exceedingly high, urbanization percentages are high and but the, econ but the population growth rates are very low. Right. So you have these smaller populations that are highly educated, very effective workforces and so the per capita GDP between the southern states and Maharashtra and say a Bihar or other states in the eastern zone, there's a huge difference. There's a big difference between the urbanization percentages and there's a very big difference between the gross enrollment ratios. Right. And the difference will also start coming in because if you look at states like Bihar, Jharkhand, the fertility rates are still very high, population growth rates are very high. So they have large young populations but very few of them are going to college. Right. If you look at Bihar, the gross enrollment ratio is only 13.6. It has hardly risen in seven years from 12.5. Jharkhand is doing slightly better. Uh, West Bengal is not doing very well. They're, it's you know it's stagnating. Uh, Uttar Pradesh is doing very well but they don't have enough employment opportunities. So there are huge state-wise differences and you can see that in play in many places. For example, Karnataka, very high per capita uh, uh, GDP, very good uh, workforce production Productivity. Bangalore is one of the highest productive uh, cities in India. Right. But our gross enrollment ratio is actually kind of lower. So what does that tell us? It tells us that there's a lot of migration from other states coming into Karnataka for jobs. And the natives are not participating as much in the as much in the workforce, even though uh, we have such good industries right in the state. So right. every state is facing a different problem. Gujarat is also this is, is somewhat in the same boat because the industry is doing very well, but the gross enrollment ratio is hardly 20. Their education system is not doing that well, but because their industry is so good, they have good economic growth. But when the knowledge economy starts coming in, when you see more automation, mechanization, their industry may start losing out because they're not focusing on higher education and they're not focusing on services. So again, Gujarat, it's a very different scenario. Uh, you look at Uttar Pradesh, very different scenario. Uh, West Bengal is a different scenario. So each state needs to focus on what's going on within the state, set right. up uh, goals for the state and then start meeting it, starting with higher education. Right. So I think the diversity among Indian states is tremendous. And you're, if you want to compare, compare the south with the east, the east is pathetic. Like she said, Bihar is sadly so behind there's no hope because if you have a GR of only 13.5%, urbanization of 11 12%, high fertility, low per capita income, Tamil Nadu per capita income is four times that of Bihar and the diversity is increasing. Where is the hope? Right. And the political system there is not conducive to investing in people. Yes, maybe the Biharis are migrating to other places. You see a lot more of them in Delhi, right. in higher education yeah. and in the south. Maybe this is happening, but it's impoverishing Bihar. If you don't invest in education, you pay for education by going outside. Right. And the Northeast is also seeing a uh, net immigration out. And I think they'll, uh, uh, you know, population will come down. So we have to study state by state. Right. Tamil Nadu GR is 49 percent. It's unbelievable. And Tamil Nadu's fertility is one of the lowest in India. One the number seven. of <laughs> young people in the age group of 18 to 23 has actually come down compared to 2011-12. Oh. So young people as a percent of population is coming down, population is aging and the young people as a percent of the population going to college in absolute numbers is coming down and more and more people are going to college because of the 66% reservation, because of the huge focus on education etc. And uh, like she said, Karnataka is a very strange case. That means our political leadership has not understood the opportunities for work and opportunities for advancement in the state. Right. They're not investing enough in people and uh, the south is good because they all live here but the north is terrible. The north right. will have indicators uh, comparable to Bihar. 
And this diversity across all the regions means that in terms of policy, we can't have one policy dictated from Delhi. Each state has to have his own policy for human capital development. Each state has to have his own policy for human capital development. And each state has to work out, uh, you know, strategies to achieve those. Right. And invest in people and make sure that human capital keeps going up. And the South is very fortunate because technology uh, is there in the yeah. South, in Hyderabad, in the Golden Triangle of Hyderabad, Kannad, Bangalore and uh, Chennai. Yeah. Yeah. And out of 4.5 million people uh, who are there, uh, possibly maybe 3, 3.5 million are in this belt. Bangalore has got 2 million. I think it's tremendous. Right. And this upsurge of high quality work, high per capita income is creating opportunities. But if the states don't invest in their own people, it will be terrible. For example, Karnataka, Bangalore has got 20 lakh people in technology or will have by March 31, including startups. Out of 20 lakh people, I think about uh, only maybe 9, 10 lakhs are for, uh, local Kannadigas who have been here 10 years. The rest of people come from outside. Nothing against that. Right. People should come. But when there's an opportunity and jobs, why are our political leaders not investing in our own students? Why are they not putting money to train them? It's almost like they've left it on autopilot. They left it. The they ignore it. They don't yeah. even look at data. I know yeah. them well. They don't look at data. The right. economic survey is a pathetic report, which doesn't analyze data the way it should. Mm. So I think they're, you know, I'm, I'm meeting the ministers uh, regularly. I, I met them today morning. I want to point it out to them. It doesn't register. Right. So that is a tragedy that's happening that policymakers in the political system is more focused on the bottom. In the bottom now, because of Modi, uh, by 2022, the necessities of life for all Indians will be met. Housing, water, power, education, food, clothing, you know, everything else will be met. But what about the thing where we have to aspire for the next 10, 12 years? Right. What about the things we need to do to reach 5 trillion, to reach 10 trillion by 2030? And that is a long-term investment. And but the most critical thing is investment in people, investment in human capital. If you don't invest now, only certain states will grow. Now, you look at 2030 for Bihar, you make any projection or anything, it is pathetic. They're not going to come up. It's a yeah. lost cause. It's like uh, Turkey, the sick man of Europe. Yeah. Right? It's the right. sick man of India. Right. And look at West Bengal. West Bengal is a gone case. I mean, the GR there in West Bengal is uh, very, very low. 19. 19% in West Bengal. And West Bengal was a place, Calcutta was a place where the whole of India went for education. Right. And about 15 years back when Mamta Banerjee was the railway minister, I saw a the news report, a, a TV program, where she was flagging off uh, trains full of students to come to Karnataka to ride the CET. I had tears in my eyes. How can right. this happen in a state where the whole of India went, they ruined the state and there's no thinking. Right. They lost two generations of young people. There are 1,50,000 Bengalis in technology in Bangalore much, much more than what is there in Calcutta. Transition to a service economy is not happening because there's not enough investment in human capital. Mm -hmm. Maharashtra is doing reasonably well, but Maharashtra is only Western Maharashtra. Right. So Maharashtra is doing reasonably well. Maratha has to lead India to a $1 trillion economy. We prepared a report how they can be a $1 trillion economy. And Maharashtra is well configured, provided they know where to invest. So Maharashtra is a very, uh, mid, with a good state with a great future because the right. last state and they you know they got the financial center, they got uh, yes. industry, they got everything else. Now, Karnataka worries me yes. because Karnataka has got only technology, some industry in the steel plants in the north of Karnataka. The coast is not uh, very well right. served. Right. So I think Karnataka requires a good strategy to yep. take full advantage and become the leading state uh, in India. It's, it's so interesting what you're saying because it's almost like people have been uh, hooked to the idea of demographic dividend. But it's not going to be an advantage on its own if you just let it sit. There's right? no demographic yeah, dividend. Yeah. Let me explain. The last 10 years, we must have graduated something like maybe 7 to 8 crore people. And look at the quality of that education they've got. Right. The great majority are just graduates. And now we are seeing <coughs> stabilization in the 18 to 23. So I think that population of 18 to 23 our population of uh, you know younger people is reduced as the total part of the population in this country. So right. when you see this kind of a change that's happening, you worry there's no demographic dividend. Right. India creates one crore, one point two crore jobs. Only about out of one point two crore jobs, maybe twenty lakh jobs pay well. The rest don't pay well. Right. They pay fifteen, twenty thousand rupees, not well. Yeah. So where are the well paying jobs? So my view is the young people the youth bulge that is happening today, that the youth bulge 
in the decade of 2000, uh, you know, 2010, 2020, 2000, 2000 to 2020, 2000 to 2020, we we'll see the largest number of young people as a part of the population in India. Right. right. So this population, this 20 years will be close to about 500 million. Wow. Now that is the bulge, youth bulge, that the youth bulge that will come in for jobs, come in to form a part of the population and they don't have a great future because the UPA spoiled everything by not investing enough. They sat on it. Right. And that impact is being felt because they were there for 10 years. I hope the NDA does much better. At least they should be more sensible to understand all the dynamics. So when this 20 year, 500 million people go into the workforce and they're going into the workforce, right. what skills will they have over the next 20 years? Right. That bulge is gone. Right. Okay. And now the young people who are coming into the decade of 20 to 20 to 30, they'll be lesser in number. And hopefully they'll be, uh, let us say, better educated, better quality, and they'll have different skills. So you have those basically a couple of decades which you almost squandered because of not investing uh, fully in developing human capital. Most in investing is policy. policy. Why didn't you open up? Yes. See, in education, the brand is important. Right. So allow the good institutions to expand. Nisha's research proves that average college has only 700 students. Why can't you allow the good colleges who've been there 15, 20 years to freely expand? Right. Right. Now you belong to a good college, a good brand, doors open for you, quality is good because the difference between good universities and bad universities, good colleges and bad colleges is management. Right. The top management is very good, you got a good institution. Top management is poor, you got a bad institution. Everybody cannot be good. Right. So allow the good to expand. Here what they do, they constrict the good because of UGC policies and allow the bad to come. Now engineering has gone the other way. The good are able to expand, the bad are dying out. So every year, 200, 300 bad institutes shut down. That is good. Right. So that reform works. So allow the bad colleges to shut down, the good ones to expand. Students should go to good colleges. Why do they aspire for IIT? They want the brand. Right. Yes. Right. And you get decent education. 